Welcome to the Crypto News. In today's video, Chamath Palihapitiya shares his thoughts on the current crypto market. He, David Freeberg, and David Sachs discuss what they call the crypto bubble, which they all agree was caused by the incessant money printing by the Federal Reserve. The second thing is that exactly what you just said, Jason, is that people don't even understand chain of custody here which is that you thought that you owned this Bitcoin. It turns out you actually may not actually own them at all. You thought that you were properly lending them out. You actually don't. There is no enforceable contract, it turns out. And so I think that's going to be an entire set of different legal issues that are now going to come to the service because people who actually legitimately lent this stuff out, for example, like if you short a stock and you go and borrow stock from any one of us, they're really tight guardrails. You know, If you wanted to go and put a credit derivative swap on against debt, there's a central clearinghouse that makes sure you're not over levered. You know, you have to go and get audited by a bank to even get in a, the kind of account that allows you to put these derivatives on. None of that was possible in crypto. Bitcoin activity as a function of year and value. Nick, can you just put that up just so that we can look at that together? The crazy thing about this chart when you look at it is, and it's pretty obvious, is that we are collectively in one way, shape or form, basically trading up uh, ever since 2018, really, with all the stimulus, because if you look at, you know, the mean price of Bitcoin, about 2018, it was a nothing burger. You know, what we were talking about was, you know, a price that was sort of between a few thousand dollars, two, three thousand, ten thousand, three thousand. You know, and then all of a sudden, when all of this stimulus money hit the market, look what happened to it. Yeah. But I think something unique also happened, which is that people really understood how to run these very complicated off-chain Bitcoin ARBs. And I think we should explain what those are because those are what's behind the three arrows capital. It's behind, you know, I think Sam had this kind of um, oblique tweet that said, you know, some of these exchanges are actually already insolvent. They're already the walking dead. So the first thing to keep in mind is that, you know, this is a completely unregulated market, right? There are no middle maker, uh, market makers per se that actually have reporting requirements to any regulatory authority. There aren't any clearing houses. There isn't a way for us to understand systemic risk as it builds in the crypto market. So what happened starting in 2018 and 19 is people realized the following things were true. It's sort of what we talked about last week. You go and do some crazy round, you, uh, you know, mark up some phantom equity in a company. That company then issues tokens. You then list the tokens, not on you know a blockchain per se, obviously, but uh, in a place where trades can happen off chain, right? And there's a bunch of exchanges where these things happen off chain because it's one you know uh, company, and then they have a bunch of segregated sub accounts. And what happens is when these things initially get listed, retail goes crazy, the price goes up, folks basically dump on retail. Um, and you know you spin that loop as fast as you can, and you can extract an enormous amount of money. Along the way, all these things like DeFi all of a sudden popped out of nowhere. And it's like, hey, you can earn 15, 16, 17, 18% just deposit the Bitcoin. And so folks would deposit Bitcoin. But then what would happen is like the places where those deposits were held would then need to obviously find places to make that 11, 12, or 13%. And so then they would go off chain to some other random person who was offering to pay them even more than that. And they would try to arb the difference. But it all catches up with you because when something like a Terra goes to zero, all the Bitcoin that was used to basically, you know, uh, run that DeFi process around Terra vanishes, you know? And then all of a sudden you, the lender are like, hey, can I have my uh, Bitcoin back? And the broker's like, well, actually I don't have it. I lent it to somebody else. Let me ask that someone else. And they're like, I'm sorry, I don't have it, but I have these Terra coins, you know, because I was running some ARB and now it went to zero. And that's essentially what we're seeing right now. So we have two big problems. And then I think we have a third that's kind of funny. The, the first big problem is like, obviously, in the absence of any regulatory oversight, this stuff is going to happen. Systemic risks are going to build up. That's what we're facing right now is an enormous amount of systemic risk, largely around Bitcoin. A bunch of this money, I think, has been essentially just vaporized. And so all these people that try to find their deposits, especially in custodial accounts in off-chain brokers, may be SOL at some point. And I think that's just going to be a huge shit show if that actually happens. And to be clear, Chamath, they don't have the keys to their own Bitcoin. They gave money 
to a custodial account. They then did this lending, went out to get them to 15%, and they don't have any recourse here. They can't get their Bitcoin. Well, look at this, this article why now. real does Bitcoin anybody, owners anybody, put them in a wallet and own the keys. Does anybody have recourse to this three arrows capital and all of this other interrelated parties that are now, you know, gone completely bankrupt because of this scam? The answer is absolutely not. Um, so that that's the first problem. You have absolutely zero oversight, which means systemic risk has been built up in the system. I'm no crypto expert, and I've not been an investor in cryptocurrencies. I read the original Bitcoin white paper. It makes sense. Bitcoin itself, to me, makes sense as a potential. Uh, initially, it was kind of interesting as a potential alternative currency, but the transaction fees were very high. And so it never really seemed to make sense as a replacement for traditional financial networks until those transaction fees dropped below those of the traditional financial networks. Um, and the, the biggest concern I've always had, which I've mentioned multiple times on the show, is that whenever anyone talks about a, quote, cryptocurrency, they talk about the price of it in dollars. And if it really is meant to be an alternative to the U.S. dollar, why are you talking about it in the price of U.S. dollars and it's up and it's down relative to dollars? And that implies ultimately that the intention would be to transact back to U.S. dollars, which implies that the intent is not to be a replacement for the U.S. dollar, which was a lot of the early prognostication of Bitcoin was it was going to be a replacement for the U.S. dollar. It's going to be an alternative to traditional monetary systems. But ultimately, if you're just measuring this in dollars and it's up and it's down, everyone's freaking out every day about crypto's up, crypto's down. That means it really is more like a security, except securities definitionally are supposed to have a secured interest in some underlying set of assets. And there's no underlying asset. It's not actually a security because it doesn't provide you a secured interest in anything. So it is effectively a bet on some systems of computers that are meant to facilitate some set of activities that, you know, ultimately people really only seem to value in U.S. dollars. So um, so I, I don't know. I mean, like, where does it all go? It seems like I mentioned at our predictions uh, episode last year that all of these smaller things are going to get blown out. These quote unquote cryptocurrencies, even though many of them don't really act like a currency. And, you know, maybe Bitcoin itself persists. And it seems to me like that's always going to have good staying power. There is um, a future technology platform here with crypto. Um, but I mean, I've been saying this for the last year that just because there's a future technology platform doesn't tell you what the pricing should be. And the price action got decoupled from the level of progress in the space. Um, you know, you should always be looking at what is the real usage, use cases, customers, revenue, things like that. And people stopped doing that. And I think part of the reason why the narrative was so powerful, if you go back to last year and the chart that Shamas showed about the, the increase in the price of Bitcoin, which is really the, the root of everything, right? Because, you know, first Bitcoin appreciates. And then if you think about it, like Ethereum is, Ethereum's market cap is like a derivative of, of the Bitcoin market cap. It's been roughly 40%. And then the altcoins sort of get the, the market cap of the altcoins is sort of derivative off Ethereum's market cap. So the whole thing kind of moved up in, in sync. And the reason why Bitcoin moved up so much is that as the Fed kept printing more and more money, you had fans of Bitcoin saying, look, the Fed is debasing the US dollar. We're going to need an alternative currency. That was a powerful narrative that the Fed seemed to be vindicating. And there was a positive feedback loop, which is the more the Fed debased the currency, the more that the price of Bitcoin went up. Now, the reason the price went up was not because they were debasing the currency. It was because they were creating so much liquidity that, that it created a liquidity effect that then drove up the price. Yeah, you, you saw an increase in speculative investments across the board, including but not limited to crypto. So again, you know, when the Fed prints too much money, it creates asset bubbles. But there's a powerful reinforcement because as the Fed was printing, Bitcoin and supporters of Bitcoin had a really great explanation for why Bitcoin was going up, which is they're destroying the US dollar. We're going to need an alternative soon. Now, I think in the very, very long term, could Bitcoin be a non-fiat currency? Yes. I mean, I actually think the technology works. You could create a, a new kind of currency that's backed by math and by cryptography as opposed to fiat government. But 
that could take a really long time. I mean, that could be decades in the future. And but what happened is the market started thinking, well, that's going to happen soon. And that's where it just got ahead of itself. That was the tulip part of it. Do you want to know one thing about crypto? I made over 3000% in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn 500,000, 1 million dollar, you have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70 in the traditional financial system and you probably will still be broke and you will be old. This is not a sexy combination as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where to start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany as you can hear and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them and if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange and one of the biggest are for example Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well established exchanges but, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much, much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy. But the moment he recommended Dogecoin, it went through the roof, to the moon so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who and you have to react before he is reacting. This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail, and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.